morning, everybody. Welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're reading the entire Bible, one chapter at a time. We're reading it together, and we're looking today at Isaiah chapter 23. And this is one where we kind of seem to be picking up what we were doing uh, several chapters ago, where we're kind of just going around the world here, around this area of the ancient Near East, nation by nation, people by people here. And so we're looking here at Tyre and Sidon. And so we have this, uh, another one of these oracles. We, we talked about this a couple times, these sorts of uh, burden oracles, these oracles that bring on lamentation and condemnation, right? And so we have this oracle here, and <clears throat> it, it seems, <laughs> again, nice thing we have today is something kind of somewhat straightforward. We have a place that we know what we're talking about. We think we know kind of what the prophet's talking about when it comes to what's going to happen. And he even gets as specific as saying that something's going to happen at the end of 70 years. So what's that about, that going into that kind of specificity here? There are still going to be some big questions, like in Cyprus um, is mentioned here. We know about that. But then when he talks about Tarshish, now where, where exactly is Tarshish? So there's some questions here for us, but... There's, I think, going to be some decent answers here, especially because we're joined by our regular guest here, Pastor Mark Preuss, pastor of St. Andrew Lutheran Church and Campus Center in Laramie, Wyoming. Welcome back, brother. Good to have you back on Thy Strong Word. Thank you. It's great to be back. Yeah, so it's, um, if I recall correctly, it's been a little while since we last had you on, and, and you guys are in the middle of... A, um, or at least very nearby, like a university um, up there in Wyoming, in Laramie, right? Yeah, I'm. We're actually, I'm in the church right now. I'm just a block from campus. I'm the campus pastor here. Right, right. And so I think when we last had you on, it was like during the summer, but now like we're in full swing. I mean, like students are like, um, you know, doing midterms and stuff, right? So what's it like? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody wants to talk to me. They're all studying. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, that's right. But, yeah, maybe maybe yeah. when it's uh, you know like the week before finals, they'll they'll, they'll be coming in to um, you know like say some extra prayers or something, perhaps. <laughs> yeah, that's my prayer. <laughs> so it's uh, and it's rough, but we have a we have a wonderful remnant of uh, of good Christian men and women here. So I'm very grateful. Yeah, very yeah, good. Yes, remnant is uh, the operative term here in Isaiah. So yeah, look, looking at some of these things here in Isaiah 23, you know, it's, uh, I just keep thinking like, man, after Isaiah 21, it's nice to have some things that we know what we're talking about here. Tyre and Sidon, those are characters, those are figures that keep coming up again and again in the Bible, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They're, uh, I mean, also in, in ancient history, um, they were very powerful cities and uh, uh, very influential. Um, and we hear about Tyre from the time of David and Solomon and um, kind of see into, uh, we see into their economy and um, the beginning of their growth and power and, and wealth. Right. So maybe, you know, as we're kind of trying to get our bearings straight here, you know, here, here's this oracle and I'm thinking that, and, and we will have a chance to talk about this, but this seems to be talking about, during kind of generally the Assyrian crisis from, you know, the middle of the 700s BC to like the middle to the late 600s BC, this, you know, general period of the Assyrians coming and just wiping everybody out, taking everything over. Um, but if, could you maybe just to kind of give us a little bit of context, talk about, so what what, what is Tyre and Sidon like as far as their status before this, you mentioned in the time of David and Solomon, we hear about we hear about Tyre and Sidon. I mean, we hear about Tyre and Sidon in, in in the Gospels in the time of Christ. So, kind of what what's the trajectory of this place that we're talking about? So, um, Tyre and Sidon were Phoenician cities, and that comes from the Greeks called them that because um, it means the purple people, <laughs> and uh, which re which reminds me of that song. Uh, purple people eater, purple but people eater, right? yeah, yeah, but uh, they and that's because they there there was a shellfish there that they would uh, crush and extract a purple dye from, right? And uh, and then they would dye 
uh, wool and linen and send it around uh, the Mediterranean world. I mean, very far from where they were. So that was kind of the beginning of their wealth. But Tyre itself was a a city on the shore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people say even back to 2000 B.C., uh-huh. And eventually, they, they built a port on an island about a half a mile from the shore, and that was that became the main port city. And it was right around the time of David and Solomon. It became um, a major uh, seaport, kind of a hub for the whole world. I mean, think New York City or Hong Kong. Right. And so they, it was a meeting place. Um, they traded. You can see if you read Ezekiel and. Uh, other places, Ezekiel, I think 27, um, they traded with Egypt. They traded uh, with, of course, um, what we would call the, what is called the Levant. So mm-hmm. that includes Palestine and then into the Euphrates. They traded with Turkey. They traded with Greece. Um, and they, I mean, Tarshish is another, Tarshish is another uh, issue that we can talk about, but right. probably far into the west of the Mediterranean. And, um, and they set up colonies, too. The Phoenicians set up lots of different colonies around the Mediterranean trading ports, um, very similar to, you know, the age of exploration in the 15th century and the 16th century when European powers had set up little trading posts on the coast of Africa and India. So they were extremely wealthy. They became extremely wealthy um, in the during the millennium before Christ. Mm-hmm. And because they, they had... Uh, the best sailors at the time, and um, and and access to all sorts of goods. And then in addition to that, what happened is that because they had access to all sorts of goods, they became famous craftsmen, and they would create all sort of, sorts of luxury items. So this is why in Isaiah 27 it talks about that, that their merchants are princes, because mm-hmm. they, they not only did they have the luxury of kings and princes, but they were able, they had access to king's courts. They were extremely influential. Right. Um, and the alliance that, um, that uh, David and Solomon formed with the king of Tyre was, is, is, is indicative of how they were basically at peace with lots of different peoples. They, they, weren't, right. they could fight, but they weren't a warlike people because they wanted peace for the sake of trade. Right, so, better just to was, make money off yeah. of everybody than to make make war with people, right? And uh, at least right, that was yeah. that was that would seems to be kind of the the way they operated. And and you're and you're right; it just seems like they were trading with everybody, and that that's kind of the thing that maybe we um we underappreciate. We just kind of assume that you know you you go into the grocery store. And, I mean, when we have <laughs> you just you just go to the grocery store, even and there's just like produce from like all over the planet. You know, I mean, like we trade yeah. with everybody, and we don't yeah. think anything of it but back in the day mm-hmm. only certain very unique people um had that kind of broad range of trading power yes exactly and in fact it's i mean it's interesting if you look at the history of the world and how they viewed uh merchants and traders so the greeks were extremely suspicious of merchants and the history of ancient greece shows conflict between the landed aristocracy and merchants. Um, and uh, the reason is because they, they were, in a sense, kind of foreigners. They had mm-hmm. no, um, they had no uh, uh, steadfast land where they lived. Mm-hmm. But, um, and so, like, for example, the god of um, merchants it was Hermes, mm-hmm. um, and was, he was also the god of thieves, because the Greeks made, made, made a very... Uh, you know, it was, it was a thin line between a merchant and a thief because they, they just didn't trust him. But Ty, Tyre had something, yeah, it's kind of funny. Tyre had something different in that they had a homeland. And so mm-hmm. they were, you know, they, they were they were from Tyre. And so they, they, they actually loved their country. They always came back to it. Um, and so they, they had that above other merchants who were, you know, in many cases were almost like pirates, you know. So, right. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, no. So, so there, there was, um, yeah. And it's also helpful to consider too, right? Again, we just, we just sort of don't think anything of it. It's like, oh yeah, you know, trading mer- merchandise, you know, business. That, that all sounds good, right? International business, right? But <laughs> just it kind of mm-hmm. had a different connotation um, at that time. 
Um, and, well, it still, it still does. I mean, people well, <laughs> complaining about jobs being shipped to China and Mexico. Well, I mean, this, sure. nothing's changed. So sure. No, no, no. That, that's, a, that's a fair point. Um, I think that kind of part of it, what you mentioned, though, too, with, with them having such this broad range of trading came with it, this this craftsmanship. And, and the thing is, uh, also in the Old Testament, um, craftsmanship and, and crafting uh, and things that had been crafted, that didn't always have a good connotation either because you got to consider what was some of the stuff that was going on. Here they go all over the world bringing all of these different things and all these different religious ideas and all these different idols. And so you're dealing with a people that had a lot of kind of this foreign influence that was viewed um, by the prophets in a really negative way. And so even though David and Solomon were, um, you know, at peace with them and receiving and making a lot of money with them together through all that trade, right? You see the negative effects mm -hmm. later, especially when, one of the most infamous queens in all of Israel's yeah. history, Jezebel, is the daughter of yeah. the, the king of Tyre, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a Sidon. Is it Tyre? It was a yeah. Sidon. yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I can look up really quick, but but uh, but, but yeah, you know, you get that couple in 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 Jezebel and in Ahaz, and it's just, I mean, that that couple is like kind of like the you know, public enemy number one in the view of the prophets in the Old Testament, basically, like, just like the, oh, yeah. the, the yeah. worst, the worst royal pair in all of Israel's history. Um, and, and it's this influence from Tyre and Sidon. Um, and that's where yeah. you get the persecution of Elijah and the slaughter of all the prophets of, of, of Yahweh. And you get the whole competition mm -hmm. on, on Mount Carmel and all this stuff, the worship of Baal and all this stuff, it's its its so tempting and alluring because why wouldn't you want to be at peace with Tyre and Sidon? Why wouldn't you want a cut of that business? Why wouldn't you want to get in on some of that, you know, enterprise, right? Get in on the floor, on the ground level of all that, you know? It's so alluring. It's so tempting. But along with it comes a lot of this really bad influence. Yes, exactly. And uh, yeah, I just looked it up. It was she was the daughter of the king of Sidon, Sidon and that's, okay. that's that's a little that's a little bit important because the uh, uh, according to history, the Sidonians from Sidon actually started Tyre, but um, but the Sidonians worshipped Baal, and the t and and the Tyrians from Tyre worshipped another god whose name I forget, but uh, it, it, he was kind of like a Hercules. He was like this man god, mm, this okay. rebirth thing. So, but they were, but they were, they were still like sister cities and they, mm -hmm. and they were very close together and, and Sidon had been more powerful, but Tyre, um, Tyre was a, was a greater city by the time of David and Solomon. So, yeah. And, uh, but and, yeah, and as far probably, as the gods are concerned. I, I was, was going to well, say, and you're, you're just mentioning kind of like how these, these different cities kind of waxed and waned at different points in history, they were just, they were united kind of as, as um, sister cities as kind of just one overall region that was just referred to as Tyre and Sidon kind of collectively at, at times it depended. Right. Um, and then you mm -hmm. kind of see that actually even today, because today Tyre and Sidon is just uh, the country of Lebanon. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It's there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's, and, and it was, and, and that's where they didn't, Tyre was Sidon was more uh, dependent upon the fruit of the land than 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 Tyre was, and that's why they worship Baal, who was who was a fertility god, which included, you know, uh, grain harvests and other things like that. And uh, so we have, um, and I would say the distinction, yeah, the the, the, the Tyrians didn't really the Tyrians rejected eventually the, the pantheon of the, of the Near Eastern gods mm -hmm. and they worship this other God. Um, I don't, I forget what his name was, but in any case, they, they, uh, they, they, they didn't push, they didn't push their religion on people so much. Um, it would be more like people would worship, uh, Melkart, I think is the name. Um, they'd worship as God if they came into contact with them. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, they, the, the, the Tyrians were extremely influential. Um, there's a legend, if you ever read the Aeneid by Virgil, mm -hmm. there's a legend that um, Dido had to flee from Tyre, and that's how Carthage was started. And it's, we're, we're certain that Carthage was 
founded by the Tyrians. We're just not sure when exactly. Um, some say at the time of Alexander the Great, and I think it's before that. But and that that eventually, you know, Carthage fought with Rome. Um, but in any case, the the religion the religion of Tyre, I think, is is best described as mammon worship. You know, that's that's the issue. Yeah. Is yeah. Uh, is their their riches and their trust and their riches, which is true of many other nations, but but yeah. but um, the pr- the pride and the power that Tyre had was not to, it, 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 just for such a small city is it it's, it wasn't to be matched. I mean, it was right. it was extremely extremely powerful. Yeah, I, I think your comparison to like New York or Hong Kong seems really apt. I mean, it's just like the name was basically just synonymous with money and making money, right? And just having loads of it and having luxury and having the best things from around the world and the finest things and, and all of that yeah. that went along with it. So it's very helpful then mm-hmm. when we have this, you know, oracle, you know, concerning Tyre here, this burden concerning Tyre. Like, and it's gonna, we're going to see as we read this here, all this talk about, you know, the merchants and all this stuff. Um, about, you know, the, the fine things and all their trading partners from all over the world. That's who we're talking about. That's how this is all fitting together. And we're seeing how no one is invincible. Um, we, not not Assyria and Egypt, the big superpowers of the day, um, militarily speaking, right? Not Tyre and Sidon, uh, the people with all the money. You know, it's, it doesn't matter, like, who, who your god or what your source of power is. It's still going to be brought low before the one true god, Yahweh of Israel and Judah. So... Uh, yeah. Thanks for yeah, that. Yeah, that's exactly that really right. Very helpful to kind of help us uh, get our bearings straight. Let's go ahead and read. Um, it's a medium-sized chapter here, so we want to take a, a decent chunk of this here. Um, maybe just like the first, well, we could probably go ahead and actually read the, the first 12 verses here. That's a big chunk, um, but we can have some time just to start getting into it. And if we go into the second half of the hour, that that's fine talking about this uh, this big chunk. But just kind of, you know, as we're listening listening for you know the mention of like the trading and uh the 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 trade uh, the i guess what's it, the merchant based economy right things like that so here we are isaiah right. chapter 23 and we're beginning with verse 1 which includes the title the oracle concerning tyre wail o ships of tarshish for tyre is laid waste without house or harbor from the land of cyprus it is revealed to them Be still, O inhabitants of the coast, the merchants of Sidon who cross the sea have filled you. And on many waters your revenue was the grain of Shehor, the harvest of the Nile. You were the merchant of the nations. Be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea has spoken, the stronghold of the sea, saying, I have neither labored nor given birth. I have neither reared young men nor brought up young women. When the report comes to Egypt, They will be in anguish over the report about Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish, wail, O inhabitants of the coast. Is this your exultant city whose origin is from days of old, whose feet carried her to settle far away? Who has purposed this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants were princes, whose traders were the honored of the earth? The Lord of hosts has purposed it to defile the pompous pride of all glory, to dishonor all the honored of the earth. Cross over your land like the Nile, O daughter of Tarshish. There is no restraint any more. He has stretched out his hand over the sea. He has shaken the kingdoms. The Lord has given command concerning Canaan to destroy its strongholds. And he said, You will no more exult, O oppressed virgin daughter of Sidon. Arise, cross over to Cyprus. Even there you will have no rest. So again, certainly one of these um, Massah burden oracles, condemnation and, and law here. And we're talking about Tyre and Sidon. But man, we just see it seems like every trading partner was mentioned in these 12 verses, right? We had we had Cyprus and we had Tarshish and we had Egypt, right? It's... um. This is going to be basically lightening everybody's wallets when Tyre and Sidon go down, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's where it's, I mean, this is the fear. It, we're talking about a Great Depression, you know, yeah. um, and not, not having, 
uh, not having the goods that pe- that that people became de- dependent on. You know, right. we think about this now. Look at all of. I often tell when I preach on Matthew six, um, don't worry about tomorrow. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, and why are you worrying about food or clothing? And I say, this is we are richer than Solomon. We have air conditioning. We have cars. <laughs> You know, we, 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 we depend upon these things to maintain a certain lifestyle. We've, we have refrigerators, you know. Right. Um, we, have, we have technology that, that can preserve food, and, and we have clothing more than, I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of like you're embarrassed if you wear the same clothes two days in a row. Right. I mean, this is, this is our culture today, and uh, imagine if all that's gone, you know, yeah. just like taken away, just like that. And, uh, and you realize, you know, and this is where, if you look at what, like Luther talks about this in the large catechism on the first commandment and, and Melanchthon talks about it too. And in, in the ap- apology, but whatever you fear, love and, the mo- and trust to the most is your God. And right. people can say, Oh, I love God. God's never done me wrong. He's taking care of me, etc." And, but take away your wealth and you get sad and mad and depressed. Well, what did you trust in? You know, right. Is this, it can be it can be health or whatever, but this is and this is true for a lot of um, Christians out there who, you know, they they're in debt through um, school or through their through their own um, just trying to live a lifestyle that they can't afford, and they get sad when they can't do the things or have the things that they had before, and so this this applies this applies to us very acutely um, in our in our present day. Um, and yeah. at any moment, it can it can be taken away. Yeah, I mean, I mean, both in terms of what you were saying about like this being like a Great Depression. I mean, people talk about you know, like in the United States right now, our our big thing and worry is the um, all the tension between you know us and China right now, and how you know if that trade is disrupted, either because of um, you know renegotiating trade trade agreements and tariff wars and all the rest. Or because of um, some of the the scandal that's been happening lately, with just in terms of censorship and whatnot, you know, people are concerned that just this is the one domino, right, that falls, or the one match that's lit that just you know sparks something bigger, and just it all just kind of blows up, like in terms of the like global economy, and this is the fear. Right. And so similarly here, you know, if if tire goes down if all that trade gets shut off, you know, what's going to happen to everybody else. But as you were saying, it's, that's the worry because we, we make a God, as you said earlier, like, like the Tyrians of mammon and we basically worship money. And, and the, and the thing is that's, it's, it's weird because, you know, uh, I imagine that the Tyrians, like they had perhaps like temples and they perhaps had, you know, um, like myths and stories that they would tell and songs and, and statues and all the rest. And so, and perhaps even sacrifices. And, um, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly, but I imagine most of the religions, um, were probably not too different from those sorts of things. And so right. we think to ourselves, oh, well, we don't, we have, we don't obviously worship money like that. I don't have a statue of a, you know, a dollar bill in my, my house. I don't, you know, pray to the Federal Reserve, you know, like I don't make a God out of money, but it's just, as you said, it's, um, yeah. it's, it's whatever you fear, love and trust in the most. And, and, and the weird thing is uh, the way that I think of it is it's like, it's the stuff that you fear, love and trust in without even thinking about <laughs> that you fear, love and trust in it. It's the stuff that you fear and you love and you trust so much, you don't even realize it, you know, because yeah. it's just life yeah. is so unimaginable without it you you just take it for granted and like you just assume and you would just say like oh well well no 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 that's just that's just necessary that's just being practical and it's because it's that holy for us that we just we can't even imagine taking it off the table right um but i want to give you a chance to kind of build on that thought but we got to go into a short break but everybody hang with us here we're looking at isaiah chapter 23 this oracle concerning tire here on thy strong word we'll be right back <laughs> The account of David and Bathsheba focuses on King David and his sins, adultery, murder, deception. It doesn't mention Bathsheba's sin. Does this mean that David raped Bathsheba? 
Wednesday on Issues Etc., we'll talk with Dr. Andrew Steinman of Concordia University, Chicago, about why evangelicals are arguing about David and Bathsheba. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. Our listeners and supporters are talking about Worldwide KFUO. I'm listening to you on my Kindle here in Great Falls, Virginia. I just want to thank you so much for the beautiful music, and I'm so thankful for you. God bless you and keep you in your good work. Thanks again. Bye-bye. To leave a message on the KFUO comment line, call 314-996-1542. Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Worldwide KFUO. Welcome back, everybody, to Thy Strong Word. I'm Pastor A.J. Espinosa. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 23, and we're joined today by Pastor Mark Preuss, pastor of St. Andrew Lutheran Church and Campus Center in Laramie, Wyoming. And we were just talking about this oracle, these first 12 verses. We were looking at how this is description of this really immensely wealthy place, a center of trade, a, a really the linchpin of a global economy here. And at the heart of it all is the idolatry of money. And that's really an idolatry that we fall into too easily, even without any altars or temples or mythology or any of that. It's just, it's the stuff that you, that you just don't even think of that really is the stuff that has us the most captivated, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I guess it's, it's recognizing the power that it has over, over your life. Because, um, like John says, we know that the whole world is under the sway of of the evil one, right. and um, and and there's that old saying, that kind of joke on the golden rule: "He who has the gold makes the rules." Right. You know, and and this is where you you can see this the um, there in, in verse uh, verses nine and and uh, ten um, that their, their their merchants were prince. Or it says it says Tyre is the bestower of crowns. Oh, right. They had they had all of this m- money, and they would, mm-hmm. you know, this is this is what the United States does. You know, yeah. we do this. If a, if a country, if if we want, if we have some economic interest in a country, we don't want communism. You know, right. not just because of its, um, like Marx says, communism presupposes atheism, which would have been a theme in the fifties and sixties. Right. Um, but but because it it destroys it destroys the economy. You know, mm-hmm. and and so we set up different governments, and right. um, and and we've been doing it for you know, uh, seventy years, and so so right. this is where they they have this power to do these things, and and then suddenly they don't, and this is where it is it is it is a mercy of God, you know, even in His wrath, God the purpose of God's wrath is to lead to repentance, and so He has to destroy people's idols. He has to destroy what we trust in. And, right. and, and this is uh, like John Gerhardt talks about this in, in a sermon that I read a few weeks ago, I think on the 16th Sunday after Trinity, mm-hmm. but he says, God, God is the source of all goods of all. Do, do you want money? He is the source. He is, he is the source of all wealth. Do you want pleasure? He is the source of all pleasure. And the earthly benefits that we have are like streams that um, that flow from God, who is the spring of all that is good. And the problem is when we rely upon these streams and not on the spring, you know, and, mm-hmm. and we, we, God sends these streams into our life. It can be wealth. It can be a good job. It can be uh, a wife and children. It can be all sorts of things. But if we trust in the streams and not in the source, then when the stream dries up because God dries it up, God does that. He right. takes away wealth. He takes away health. He takes away family. Um, then the question is: Is well, where are you going to go? You need to go to the, you know, the pure fountain of Israel, which is the, the Holy Scriptures, which reveal Christ and Him crucified for you, because right. He rules. He actually has the power, despite what you see and despite what you, your reason can comprehend. Jesus, the man who was crucified on the cross, there is all of God's power to overcome the world and to give you everything you need. And, right. and uh, this is, you know, it's like Mary and Martha. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but there is one thing needful, and Mary uh, has chosen it, and it will not be taken away from her. 
and that's where all of these, you know, it just gets tiresome reading Isaiah. Like, man, every single country around them is just being, <laughs> you know, eviscerated by the right. by the law. Right. And and the reason is is because the, there are only two religions: There's the religion of works and the religion of grace. And the religion of works will always rely upon power and wealth to show their to, to show to other people that they're in charge, that you should trust in them, that you should right. desire them, and, and and or even fear them. Right. And uh, and that's why you know God is tearing. He's he's telling the Israelites before it happens. He's telling Judah before it happens. This powerful country that has more wealth than anybody else is going to is going to be brought down. Right, and, so, and that's what you see, like in verse in verse eight and nine, right? Like, oh, who's purposed this? You know, who who's who's the one who's bringing them down, and what's going on? Right? Yeah. It says very clearly in verse nine, it's 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 Yahweh. Yahweh is the one who's yeah. bringing all of them down. And as we saw earlier in Isaiah, you know, Assyria is just his weapon. It's his axe. Right. You know, but it's God, mm-hmm. the one who's swinging it. Um, he's the one who's using the Assyrians to do all things. And as it says, it's to dishonor the honored of the earth, to defile the pompous pride of all glory, to bring us low. And, and this is what we saw in Isaiah 22 just just uh, yesterday when we were looking at, you know, there, there again, you know, there was that word exultant, right, that you have mm-hmm. Tyre um, portrayed here as this exultant city that's just full of, you know, just celebration and all of the luxury Well, similarly, we had that description in Jerusalem last time in Isaiah 22, because, you know, there's Mm -hmm. all the people like, hooray, we survived the Assyrian siege, right? And again, it's just the perspective is, guys, do you know why you had to have the siege to begin with? It's because, just like you were saying, it's because I'm here and I'm trying to demolish your idols. I'm I'm trying to bring you to repentance here. That's, That's why we're doing it. And it's... You know, it's scary to think that that's what it takes. I mean, just massive war and death and destruction, and and that's the kind of wake up call. I I, I have the, a terrible story along these lines, right? Um, I, I mean, it's <laughs> it's it's funny and terrible. Um, but so when when my firstborn was born, um, it was under these circumstances of pretty bad sleep deprivation for me and my wife Gabby. And I became um, so exhausted after a period of just being awake for a straight like 50 hours or something like that, um, that I was just so exhausted. I just, I just totally was just out. I was out um, there in the hospital and there, um, and then our, our firstborn, she starts crying. My wife starts like shouting for me, um, you know, is trying to like, you know, throw things at me to get my attention because she's like all tied up and she can't, you know, reach me and she can't just gently tap my shoulder or anything. She's stuck yeah, um, in a right. hospital bed. Right. So the people are, are yelling and crying and screaming. Um, eventually there's a nurse who comes and the nurse is like in my face shouting at me. I slept through the entire thing. Didn't wake up. For wow. I, I think they could have poured water on me and it wouldn't have woken me up. But like just, just that image of just somebody who's just that asleep and there's and just nothing is going to wake them up. It's scary to think that we are in this, you know, this kind of, and that's why you actually kind of have this, the metaphor of sleep used um, in Paul, especially, right? That we were like, so like asleep yeah. um, under the influence of this, um, this, this, this dream or this influence of, of wealth and of sin and the temptations to power that we'd be so asleep that, that nothing would wake us up, nothing except for war and bloodshed and that that's what it would take. You know, just, I mean, wow, what a spell has been cast on us, right? How bewitched we are if, if that's what it takes to, to wake us up is like God just having to come in with violence. Yes. I, I mean, that's, it, it's, it's people talk about that. You know, people say um, from my grandparents' generation, you know, we had the depression. We, we went through hard times. My, my host mom in Germany grew up um, in East Germany. And she tells me that, uh, you know, that these, these young people are so soft uh, yeah. and, and weak. Like she said, I, I'm, every day I am thankful for a hot shower because she didn't have one. Like she had like three hot showers in her life before the wall came down, yeah. you know. And, and, uh, because, and, and this is where, this is a prophecy, or this is a prophecy of Paul. Men will become lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, you know. And, um, and this is what people this is what happens. And I, I've seen this many times and we have people in our, and all of us have people in our family or, or friends where hard times come 
and then God delivers them, gives them the money or the better health. And uh, But before that, they, they sought God. But then once they have their money and their health back, they go right back to worshiping money and health, you know, yeah. and just forgetting God. And this is the history of Israel, like during the time of the judges and the kings, you know, is that is that there's this always, we're always being drawn to look at the world as the source of our happiness, as the source of our strength, as the source of our wisdom, you know. Um, yeah. But like Jeremiah says, uh, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom or the strong man in his strength or the rich man in his riches. But let him who glories glory yeah. in this, that he knows me, that I am the Lord. And and that's that's where, again, like those streams are going to dry up mm-hmm. and we need the spring. We need the wounds of Christ. And, and yeah, so yeah, it's, no, it's uh, no, no, yeah, I intrigued. understand that's... I was going to say I, I was I'm intrigued and and, and I appreciate you you bringing it up. You've been mentioning a couple of times now wealth and health as a pair, um, money and health and and well being and and I I think it's very that's um, very insightful to do that because I, I think that in some ways we in 2019 America are kind of kind of waking up from a hey whoa like we've been focused a little bit too much on money um because we've been compromising our health along the way and uh you know this is the, the, i guess i don't know the kind of woke spirit speaking of uh sleepy metaphors right um of 2019 yeah. <laughs> that, that we're coming well around done. and saying like you know hey we we, we just you know we, we've been everything's been sacrificed for money and we need to focus on well-being and so you hear all of today like i mean never before like right it seems like in american society have we focused so much on questions like you know mental health right and, you know, talking mm-hmm. about, um, you know, I mean, I mean, in some ways, and it's just long overdue, right? And talking about like burnout, right? And we're, and we're doing that in, in our um, in our circles, right? Talking about, um, you know, like how can pastors and congregations be healthy, right? How can you have healthy uh, pastors' families and, and not be like asking them to like engage in unhealthy behaviors just to hold everything together? And so there's this big emphasis and this big push that we're seeing talking about health and in some ways it's like you know yeah it really is just long overdue but (laughs) as you're saying there's always a danger then yeah Yeah. right if you just are saying like hang on a second okay maybe we won't worship just wealth we'll worship wealth and health (laughs) instead of instead of worshiping Mm -hmm. um, one god by the name of money you worship two gods by the name of you know uh, you know, money and, you know, fitness or, or whatever the kind of aspect of health we kind of fixate on, you know, money, money and comfort. But like, it's very, it's very easy for these to be kind of buddy gods that kind of work as a pair that, okay, we, we go and we make room for health, but it's really just kind of the other shoe in this kind of false worship. Yes. Yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, the Tyrians, the, this god that they worshipped was um, they would every year they would send out a ship or like a raft and they would burn in effigy this god who would then be renewed. Um, you know, it's a typical like death and resurrection or reincarnation type stuff. Yeah. And and they recognized that things die, but they were always kind of like hoping for a renewal. And the god they had was a strong, healthy man. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it's this, this is and another thing too. The reason they go together is not just because they rhyme, which is awesome, <laughs> but, but, uh, but also because those who have money can survive better. Yeah. You know, they have better doctors, they have access to fresh foods yeah. and other things like that. And so you see this today, like in the old days, the poor were the very skinny ones cause they didn't have enough food. Right. But now the poor are more overweight because they're eating these, these, these processed foods, right. right? And that, that aren't good. You know, they're not, I, and mm-hmm. I know this, I have, I have, um, a lot of kids and the biggest hit on my, you know, on our budget is fresh fruits and vegetables to keep right. our kids healthy, you right. know? And, and so that's, that's the, um, you know, so those things are together, but as far as our dependence upon them, it goes back to our life, you know, mm-hmm. who gives us the ability to do anything, you know? Yeah. Who gives us? Who gives us? Who gives us uh, our health and our wealth? And and this goes again to uh, what reason can understand. Um, 
uh, according to your reasons, hire is very, very powerful. Why? Because, well, you need money to have food, to have good health, and they have that, you know? And so right. their God must give that to them. Right. And so whatever they're doing, we need to do. And on the one hand, yeah, you should keep the seventh commandment and use your money wisely and trust in God and give to God and the, and the poor and learn how to budget your money and not spend what you don't have. Um, right. And you should take care of your body and because it's a gift from God and you need to use it to serve God and your neighbor. So these are truths, but, but is, you know, why are you, you know, what's the motive behind this? Is it so that you can enjoy life on this earth and have the best possible life, your best life now, (laughs) like Joel Osteen says, or is it so that you can serve God and your neighbor and trust in him? This is why Paul tells Timothy, command those who are rich not to trust in uncertain riches. Yeah. You know, and, yeah, and the love right. of money is is a root of all evil. And um, people who desire to get rich pierce themselves with many pangs because yeah. um, because they're they're worshiping and serving the creation rather than the creator. Right. Yeah. From and, our epistle from a few yeah. weeks ago. And, and, and you're just right. And this and this is the thing. Right. What's what's the motivation you, you were saying? Right. Because, you yeah. know, so so you can't misunderstand what we're saying here. We're not saying so we shouldn't be focused so much on on wealth and health. Actually, given our current context, um, the kind of Christian antidote is going to end up talking a lot about wealth and health (laughs) because we we need to hear a corrective on those things, right? right? And and, and those things are important blessings from God, from the Creator, from that fount of every blessing, like you were saying, that spring Right, maybe because God mm-hmm. really is the one who is the the spring that produces the the wealth and the health. So the the thing is yeah. not that we would um, go back to ignoring health and only focusing on money, um, or that we would just never talk about money, which is a really great way to fall into the idolatry of money when <laughs> no one talks about it because it's too holy to mention its name. Right. So that's right. not the solution. But, but the question is, as okay, as we're talking about wealth and health, how are we talking about it? And when we're talking about how those things are important, are we talking about how they're more important than everything else and how that needs to be the number one consideration in all things? Or are we talking right, exactly. about how even those things actually are number two and number three to other important considerations? Yes, absolutely. And, and this is true not only with regard to faith, um, where your faith is, but also with regard to the good works that come from it. You know, we think, oh, if I had more money, I could do this. If I were in better health, I could do that. But no, no, the greatest works that you can do as a Christian, uh, the only good works that you can do are through faith in Christ. And these are the small little things that you do. And you don't, you don't trust in these works, but the world does, you know, this is why the world uh, goes after Christ because Christ says, yeah, I'm not impressed with your works. Uh, they're, they're not going to help you. And, uh, and this is where like, you have a couple things. One is the story of the rich man, the foolish rich man who has this bumper crop. And he's like, I'm going to tear down my barns, build new barns. And I'm going to sell my right. soul. soul, just, you know, eat, drink and be merry and enjoy your life. And then God comes to him that night and says, you fool, this very night, your soul is required of you and who, who and who will own what you now have, you know? So it's just, it's this kind of foolish thing. And there's this hymn, uh, What is the World to Me?, which is a beautiful uh, mm. hymn. And, uh, and the, the, one of the stanzas goes, The world seeks after wealth and all that mammon offers, yet never is content, though gold should fill its coffers. Mm-hmm. I have a higher good, content with it I'll be. My Jesus is my wealth. What is the world to me? You know, it's, it's this, beautiful, this beautiful thing because, and this is where you see this all throughout the scriptures, you know, even in, uh, like in Lamentations, after Jerusalem is destroyed, which happens, by the way, around the time that, that Nebuchadnezzar comes and destroys um, Tyre. And, mm-hmm. uh, but even, even in this, like, uh, uh, Jeremiah says, the mercies of the Lord are new every morning. You know, great is your faithfulness. It is good for a young man to bear the yoke in his youth. And he, this teaches us in this, this humbling of us. And, right. you know, it takes a lot. You know, like sometimes we have members in our congregation where they're just so secure and they think that they're doing just fine and they never come to church. And then all of a sudden you kind of wonder like, man, I wonder what it's going to take for this person to wake up and realize he needs Christ. Right. You know, and sometimes it's like, well, 
what happened to my kid? He, he denied the faith. Well, you know, you took him to sports games and, and uh, skipped church his whole life. You know, <laughs> like, what do you, you worship leisure and mammon and this is what exactly. happened, you know? And, and, so. and God forbid that it takes, you know, an accident or a devastating illness or even war, right, um, for something, for us to get that wake-up call, right, and to finally be woken yeah. up out of that stupor. But, I mean, we see it again and again. It often does take that because we we just it's so easy how we can just get wrapped up like you were saying and we can say like well i mean but you know okay you're you're making a a fine what you're saying sounds fine and all but let's be realistic how can you do any of these good things if you don't have money how can you do any of these good things if you don't have health right and that sounds plausible until as as Mm -hmm. you're saying you can turn the question around though well, how can you do any of those good things unless you're fed by the word of God? How can you do any of those good things unless you're praying and in conversation with God and God's answering and blessing your work, right? I mean, you can turn around yeah. and Amen. make anything and, and say, actually, you can't do anything without that, right? And, and so yeah. the thing is, it, it always ends up being, it, it, it's always a, a post hoc rationalization on our part. And, and mm-hmm. we're just, we're rationalizing the irrational, um, you know, sinful desire that's just out of control in our hearts. And it sounds reasonable and we'll say like, oh, well, no, I'm just being responsible with, with money and, and, and with my health and, and taking care of myself. But it's like, we got to be more careful yes. than that. and it requires a certain kind of brutal honesty. But um, I, I feel like we could, this is- I was going to say, I feel like we could profitably talk about this theme for like, the next, you know, just week and just cancel everything and be like, all right, just me and Pastor Preuss are yeah. going to talk about wealth and health. We're doing a series. But um, you mentioned yeah. actually the destruction of Tyre and the at the hands of the Babylonians. And hey, the Babylonians are in chapter 13, all right? So I'm going to seize upon a segue while I can and, mm-hmm. <laughs> just read, and read the rest right. of the chapter. <laughs> but yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, let's, let's, so let's pivot a little bit here and just make some uh, closing remarks here. So this is, this is the second half of the chapter here in Isaiah chapter 23 after this description of how the wealth of Tyre is going to be undone. Here we are, chapter uh, 23, verse 13. Behold, the land of the Chaldeans. This is the people that was not. Assyria destined it for the wild beasts. They erected their siege towers. They stripped her palaces bare. They made her a ruin. Wail, O ships of Tarshish, for your stronghold is laid waste. In that day, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, like the days of one king. At the end of 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the prostitute. Take a harp, go about the city. O forgotten prostitute, make sweet melody, sing many songs, that you may be remembered. At the end of seventy years, the Lord will visit Tyre, and she will return to her wages, and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. Her merchandise and her wages will be holy to the Lord. It will not be stored or hoarded, but her merchandise will supply abundant food and fine clothing for those who dwell before the Lord. All right, so we got a couple of things that just uh, seem perhaps bewilder- bewildering at a first glance here. Um, so, and of course, mm-hmm. we've wisely allowed ourselves five minutes to try to explain them. So, um, first of all, <laughs> you've got the mention of the Chaldeans. Okay, so another term for basically the Babylonians. So, okay, so we're talking about the Babylonians all of a sudden now. Um, we have been kind of focusing on the Assyrians devastating Tyre, but now we're talking about the Babylonians. Um, and then you got this 70 years thing and this prostitution metaphor, and that would kind of make sense as a way of, you know, taunting perhaps Tyre, um, kind of as you were saying, that the, the kind of that, that image of, uh, you know, the, the one who's chasing money not really having any other loyalties or kind of, um, you know, roots in the ground, but just wandering around wherever the money goes. And so, okay, we can kind of understand that, except that you get in verse 18, that her wages will be holy to the Lord. So yeah, you, you yeah. got your, you got your pick on what you want to try to make sense of in the last like minute or two here. <laughs> okay. So the short, the, the summary of it is um, that Nebuchadnezzar came around the time. I don't remember the year, but around the same time that he conquered and, and sacked Jerusalem. So mm-hmm. this is like, uh, what is it? Five, when was the sack of Jerusalem? I can't believe I'm forgetting. Like 538, right? Uh, was it? Yeah. Okay. So around that time, 
Um, and uh, it was 587, 587. And, oh, uh, oh, yeah, no, that's and, right. No, 538 was, yeah. it was Cyrus, then, Cyrus then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so around that time, so what he, he, he besieges Tyre for 13 years. Right. And the Tyrians, most, and finally, they just abandon the city and they just escape. And right. because, because Nebuchadnezzar doesn't have the ships. And so he conquers the city. He doesn't tear down the walls or anything. He just goes in there and gets mad and takes what's left, which wasn't that much. And, uh, and so they had to go flee. And so they're fleeing to all these different places, right? But then it took, it took them a long, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had it and held it for a long time. And around the time of Cyrus the Great, it would, it, and they took, uh, they took some of the Tyrians to Babylon. And so Cyrus, uh, I got to know these people too. Remember, he would always take the wise men like Daniel and Shadrach, mm-hmm. Meshach, and Abednego. And so he, it's likely that at the same time that Jerusalem was being built near there, he, he told them to go rebuild Tyre. And then what, what Tyre does is Tyre has to go and beg for business again, like a prostitute. Do you mm-hmm. see? It's like, hey, look at my wares. Look what I have. Right? So that's, that's kind of the, the – that, that explains that part. And the last part, that it shall be holy to the Lord, this is where uh, we, we read this in, in Nehemiah, that um, the, uh, the, there are Tyrians who are providing food for the, the remnant of Judah that has returned and are building up uh, the city and the temple. And, and, and so the, the actually, like, their goods are now coming back here. Another interpretation, so that's, that, that actually happened. Another interpretation is that when Paul went to... Tyre, you found Christians there, um, right. and so that their their good works actually, it's like like the prophecies that all the wealth of the nations comes to mm-hmm. the church, right? right? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you, and so and ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, and uh, and this and this is this is Christ. Everything belongs. The only things that remain are the good works that are the good works that um, Christ. Uh, uh, that Christ works in us. And so right. that's kind of, I hope that's a nice short summary. With the time I, I, think, that we I think, yes, I think that's very admirable given the short amount of time, but right, kind of appreciating 70 years as we saw it in Daniel, very symbolic length of time, right? And so whether it's something that's going on in the time of the Assyrians, first of all, you know, when the Assyrians are on a roll or to the destruction at the hands of the Babylonians, or then as you were saying later, when you know, the Persians are helping to build everybody up and then and you end up with the Tyrians supporting Judah, right? As just um, all these different right. things are all being brought together to build up God's people as they rebuild. And then ultimately, right, as the wealth of the nations comes to the church and God's people, uh, Israel in Jesus Christ. So, yeah, th- that, that pattern and looking at things from the perspective of God's time, Right. I think that is a very nice way to kind of tie this idea off here. But yeah, um, brother, it's just always so much fun having you on. And I really just I really appreciate the way that, you know, you help us to kind of to take to take this apart and kind of look at, you know, wealth and health at both as, you know, idols that went on at that time, whether it was there, you know, worshiping that and entire or whether we're worshiping it today. And so uh, certainly something that uh, we all just need to you know, pray, Lord, have mercy for, and we see that it's only Christ that really rescues the human heart, um, which is otherwise just so asleep, right? So thank you, brother, yeah. for the insight, and looking forward to next time. Everybody, that was uh, Pastor yeah. uh, Mark Preuss, pastor of St. Andrew Lutheran Church in Campus Center in Laramie, Wyoming. Thanks for tuning in today. We ask that you would uh, check out our underwriters. We thank them at the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, lhfmissions.org. Until next time, everybody, peace. You've been listening to Thy Strong Word, produced by the Lutheran Church, Missouri Senate Office of National Mission in cooperation with Worldwide KFUO, the official broadcast ministry of the LCMS. Your support is vital for this program to continue. You can make a gift safe, secure, and easily online at kfuo.org. Thank you for listening and supporting Thy Strong Word.